Defending Israel with David Harris on JBS is made possible in part by a generous gift in memory of Eric and Mira J. Spector, the Paul and Lynn Late Family Foundation to Life to Love, Barbara and Bob Goodkind, the Patricia Worthen Ullman Foundation, Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. Since that awful, unforgettable day of October 7th, we've had some extraordinary guests on this show, and a number of you have been clamoring for some of them to come back. So, we are lucky today to have Natasha Hausdorf back. For those of you who may not have seen the first show, Natasha is a distinguished barrister in London, she is a staunch and articulate defender of the state of Israel, and she is the legal director for UK Lawyers for Israel, a charitable trust. Welcome back. It's so good to be with you. Thank you so much. Natasha, since we last spoke, uh, among other things, you were in Toronto for the semi-annual, what are called the Monk Debates, and you teamed up together with Douglas Murray, who's also well known to the JBS audience, against Mehdi Hassan and Gideon Levy uh, about a proposition on whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And before asking you to reflect on the debate, I just want to tell the viewers, if you have not seen this debate, find it. Find it on social media. At least the excerpts of both Natasha and Douglas destroying the other side. And I was a competitive debater for many years, and I can tell you in watching this debate, you will get a master class in how to present an issue with the added bonus of two British accents and trademark British understatement. We could all learn. Thoughts on the debate? Well, David, it was my first uh, experience of a monk debate. Uh, I hope it wasn't just the British accent that caused them to uh, to reach out and to invite me along. It was a bonus. But, uh, <laughs> I'm told I'm told it can be a bonus, which is great. Um, it was also a wonderful opportunity to team back up with Douglas. Uh, the last time we spoke in a debate together was some 15 years ago. So uh, this one was a long time coming. And I couldn't think of a better subject, really. Uh, it's so topical and it is so badly misunderstood and misrepresented by those anti-Zionists, uh, including Gideon Levy and Mehdi Hassan on the opposition uh, of that debate a, a week ago. Um, it was a real opportunity, I think, to reflect on this important subject in light of everything that we've seen uh, since the 7th of October. And albeit it was clear to me that anti-Zionism is the modern subset of anti-Semitism, the acceptable face, if you will, and has been for some time. I think over the last eight months, many, many poor people have come to that realization. Uh, and I imagine that's one of the reasons that I'm going to uh, accept very gratefully your, your praise um, in terms of how the debate itself panned out. But I'd also like to think that Wright won the day and that after the last eight months, many more reasonable people have come to the realization and the understanding that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. And we've seen that very sad state of affairs played out around the world on an almost daily basis uh, and on our television screens. Uh, Natasha, did anything that Mehdi Hassan say or Gideon Levy say surprise you? Um, the general content, no. I mean, there were occasions on which uh, Gideon, I think, went further than he had uh, even dared on previous occasions. At one point, he referred to Israel as the most uh, brutal regime in the world. Uh, and I think the audience knew full well what to do with that. Uh, Gideon has, in previous interviews, uh, acknowledged that you could fit uh, the people who agree with him in Israel in, inside a phone booth. Uh, so he's certainly not reflective of uh, any 
public opinion in Israel. He very much represents the extreme fringe um, in every possible uh, manifestation of, of that term. Uh, and unfortunately, we have seen uh, Mehdi Hassan uh, present himself uh, as the archetypal uh, anti-Zionist, uh, especially since the 7th of October, and use these appalling um, developments and that tragedy as a platform to continue his vicious bile and, and misrepresentations uh, against the Jewish state. So in many respects, it was um, a, a carefully curated, I think, debate uh, by Monk to put uh, this issue on trial um, in a way that I think has, as I hope, uh, certainly put the matter to, to bed. Um, obviously, that's very much informed by the current circumstances. But an awful lot of, at least what I tried to address um, in the context of my opening, uh, was rooting the anti-Zionist propaganda uh, in the context of the modern blood libels. Uh, I talked about ethnic cleansing, apartheid, uh, and uh, also uh, about genocide. And um, I I'm afraid we didn't get the opportunity to get on in the course of the debate to uh, the liables of occupation and, and many, many others that uh, the opposition uh, put forward. Uh, but in the context of understanding that it is these falsehoods and these modern blood libels that underpin the anti-Zionist uh, philosophy, uh, I think it's even clearer that this is the updated form of the ancient blood libel uh, and therefore very much a form of anti-Semitism uh, which needs to be called out. And you also called out Mehdi Hassan, um, what should we call it, um, as a liar when he misrepresented the quote of Arthur Balfour, tried to present him as an anti-Semite. Uh, I, I don't know how you happen to have the full quote <laughs> at your desk, so to speak. But um, uh, viewers, if you, if you can't watch the entire debate, please watch Natasha's opening statement, her response to uh, Mehdi Hassan's attempt to mischaracterize Arthur Balfour, and her closing statement, and of course the same for Douglas Murray. Just one other question on the debate, and I'd like to move on then, Natasha, but I know in my own career, we sometimes had, had this debate among ourselves how much legitimacy should we confer on people that we consider otherwise illegitimate? Uh, should Gideon Levy appear on the same stage or not uh, with mainstream uh, figures? And I, but in the Jewish world, spent 32 years uh, not appearing on stage with Gideon Levy or not having him on any AJC stage either. And I probably yes. would have done the same with Mehdi Hassan. This was different. But did you have any second thoughts or hesitations before? It's always a question, uh, and I think a valid one to assess on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, often this comes up in the context of you know, individuals that um, vocally support terror organizations or otherwise have links to terror. Uh, and I think in the past, I have always drawn a very firm line uh, with respect to those sorts of situations. Um, here, uh, it was presented uh, to me as um, a debate that was going ahead uh, in the context of the other three speakers taking part. And I think that made my decision certainly an awful lot easier because these are individuals on the opposition, Gidon and Mehdi, that are platformed, uh, whether it's appropriate or not. And in that context, I think it's all the more important that they are called out. Um, the Balfour quote wasn't the only reason uh, that I had called Mehdi Hassan a, a liar. Um, there was a great deal of, in fact, he returned the compliment. Unfortunately, it wasn't on an issue that I hadn't actually spoken about. And uh, another clear indication that uh, he wasn't listening to what it was that Douglas or I were talking about in the context of that debate, but simply rattling off the same tropes, the same blood libels uh, and the same falsehoods. Um, but in a context where there is so much misinformation being put out by individuals like those that represented the opposition last week, um, understanding all of the concerns uh, and the hesitations one might have of um, lending uh, 
extremists like that a voice, it's extremely important to challenge their falsehoods. Mm -hmm. And I think where people feel in a position um, that there is a need to do so, uh, then, then it's important to take those opportunities. I mean, we had a, a, an instance here in the United Kingdom where um, because of the late notice of a parliamentary committee um, to do with, if you can believe it, uh, the support for an arms embargo on Israel, uh, I was faced with a situation not quite as you describe, but where there was a former justice of the Supreme Court here in the United Kingdom providing evidence uh, in support, uh, not just of an arms embargo against Israel, but also of a misrepresentation of the International Court of Justice's Provisional Measures Order, the first one that was made on the 26th of January. And I was faced with a, a choice of allowing those misrepresentations to go ahead unchallenged or uh, despite the significant imbalance in experience and um, uh, reputation, uh, taking uh, up the opportunity to provide the counter uh, to a former justice of the Supreme Court, Lord Sumption, uh, as a junior member of the bar myself, uh, the optics of that were perhaps uh, somewhat less than ideal, but the importance of providing the counter and actually putting forth the accurate and factual position uh, was hugely significant uh, because less than 30 hours later, the president of the International Court of Justice who had made the order upon which Lord Sumption and I were disagreeing and in fact vindicated uh, every single word that I said. So um, more often than not, I think it's important to take up the opportunities to counter the misinformation and ensure that uh, individuals who are being platformed to spread falsehoods uh, do not uh, enjoy those platforms by themselves. Uh, Natasha, if I may, would you please delete the word junior from your self-description? Uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a description that anyone at the bar that is uh, not quite yet no. a, a uh, King's uh, Council, uh, I'm afraid, meets. As, <laughs> a, as a non-member of the bar, in fact, as a non-attorney, I can only say this, JBS viewers, uh, I could not feel more safe and secure being represented in the larger world today by the tag team of Natasha Hausdorff and Douglas Murray. I, I simply cannot imagine uh, a stronger, more knowledgeable, more courageous and more articulate team. Now, we have the problem of time and you are a barrister who knows all the ins and outs of charged words like genocide and occupation and resistance. So I'm going to ask you to, in a way, stay in but step out of your legal shoes to give us sort of short summaries because JBS viewers need to understand how to respond when they hear the word genocide eight months into the, to the war. Is this a genocide, Natasha? Um, it never was, and it certainly isn't uh, today. The critical thing to remember when people are using the term genocide is that it is a specific term that reflects an intention to eradicate a racial, religious, or ethnic group in whole or in part. This term was coined after the Holocaust by Raphael Lemkin to provide a, a legal terminology to, to the, what had befallen the Jewish people, that they were targeted as a people intentionally. That is at the core of genocide. And quite apart from the falsehoods that we hear repeated on a daily basis about uh, Israel's actions in uh, conducting its lawful defense, self-defense in the Gaza Strip, um, whatever one wants to say about the particular strikes that Israel has taken, about the military tactics, and there are military experts, for example, uh, John Spencer and Colonel uh, Richard Kemp, who have uh, spoken at length of the unprecedented measures that Israel takes to prevent civilian casualties. But even if one were to discount all of that, this notion that Israel is in any way intentionally seeking to destroy a group in whole or in part is a monstrous libel. Uh, it, it's a blood libel. It is a blood libel. It's one of the modern blood libels that I referenced in, in the Monk debate. Uh, Natasha, what, what about the notion then of Israel using disproportionate force? How does one respond to that one? 
Well, proportionality as a rule and a, a principle in the law of armed conflict um, is very clear. It's not at all the way that it is discussed in the media. In fact, I would say it's probably the most misrepresented element of international law ever. Uh, proportionality certainly doesn't require um, a comparison of casualty figures. Uh, that would be uh, macabre, but it would also encourage Hamas to increase the civilian casualty count as, as it is already uh, being encouraged, unfortunately, to do. Um, what proportionality and the law of armed conflict requires is that every military commander weigh up the direct and concrete military advantage anticipated by a strike against the anticipated civilian or collateral damage. And that is a delicate balancing exercise, but it is one that the IDF carries out on a strike by strike basis with uh, direct involvement of lawyers from the Military Advocate General Corps it, in a fashion which I would suggest is actually also unprecedented in the way that modern militaries function with that level of consistent, detailed, direct input by lawyers, as well as by the commanders on the field. And in that respect, uh, Israel's proportionality assessment um, is enviable uh, by other armies, including the United States and the United Kingdom. And, and that has been the subject of detailed assessments in previous conflicts in Gaza. So let me um, stress, you, you said enviable. Uh, I want hmm. to be sure our viewers heard it, enviable. Other, 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 other armies would struggle to meet those standards, and they say that themselves. So in that context, uh, to be levying this uh, canard of disproportionate action against Israel um, is legally illiterate, but it is primarily based on an awful lot of the misreporting that we have in the media. And undoubtedly, the images that are coming out of Gaza in particular, which are traumatizing, you know, there is widespread death and destruction. What we need to be clear about is the party that is responsible for that, and, and that is Hamas. Um, I've seen this recently in another report put out by uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry uh, that is vilifying Israel and a suggestion that because of the widespread destruction in Gaza, that in and of itself is evidence that there are war crimes and crimes against humanity. And what this commission clearly doesn't take into consideration is Hamas's use of civilian infrastructure as part of its terror network. The fact that they use schools, mosques, hospitals, and by all accounts, every second civilian home as part of their terror base means that those civilian, otherwise civilian objects, become military objects and indeed in many respects military targets in the context of this war. So and uh, that Natasha, let me stop you there for a moment because since we last spoke, Israel had a dramatic rescue of four hostages. And yes. there were those around the world who said the price paid in casualties in Gaza was too high to justify the rescue of four Israelis held hostage. What's your response? Well, the first uh, point here is that they have absolutely no means of determining that. Uh, the second is that that is done on notoriously false casualty figures. Uh, those that have been put out by Hamas have been debunked over the last eight months. Uh, third, I would say on Israel's account of what occurred, uh, those that engaged the rescue forces as they were seeking to leave with the hostages were part of the Hamas terror infrastructure, uh, the force, Point would be that this is a terror, uh, a counter terror operation that necessarily had to take place in a busy civilian neighborhood because of where Hamas was hiding the hostages. All of this, of course, is entirely contrary to international law in terms of Hamas's conduct and activity. But the manner in which Israel prosecuted this particular operation and successfully rescued those four hostages was calculated in order to minimize any collateral damage and harm to the surrounding civilians there. The way that they went in, um, surreptitiously, one might say, in order to not arouse suspicion, in order to prevent Hamas from killing the hostages uh, before they were able to extract them, and in the manner in which they sought to extract those hostages quickly and put them onto um, vehicles and then waiting helicopters. I mean, all of that indicates the extreme measures that Israel's taking to prevent any excessive military conduct in the context of these areas. And it's also 
very important to note that this this operation occurred in, in a part of Gaza in which there had not been prior military activity. So everything that we've heard about Israel being you know, either in control of Gaza or having flattened the entirety of Gaza um, or you know, any other um, part of the misreporting that we've heard about Israel's military activity there uh, is again proved wrong simply by uh, a proper analysis of this particular story. So uh, uh, your, your adversaries would say your use of the word collateral damage itself is a desensitized term that minimizes the reality of human suffering. Is it a desensitized term, collateral damage? Well, it's a legal term and a military term, and so I use it in that context. Good. But you're right, the, these are civilian deaths. Um, some of them. I mean, what we have to be clear is that Hamas does not make any distinction between combatants and civilians. Uh, it was not civilians that opened fire on Israeli forces seeking to extract those hostages. Uh, those were combatants um, and therefore legitimate targets. And it, it's critical that Israel has estimated it has killed in excess of 15,000 terrorists in the course of the, the, this war in Gaza. And that is not something that the media acknowledges at all. Occupation. If you go to American universities, they're a little quieter now, it's summertime. But the key words are resistance to the occupation. Is there an occupation? And is Hamas a resistance organization? So we talked about uh, the fallacy of occupation the, the last time I was on your program, and, and critically, it's the rule of customary international law, uh, uti possidetis juris, that tells us the status of the territory when Israel was established in 1948. And that puts the lie to this idea that there is a, a legal occupation. Of course, this is a, a, an occupation, I should say, in a legal sense. Um, even the phrase illegal occupation uh, is not one that exists in international law outside of the example of Israel. So uh, I think we have to be very wary when we see new concepts, uh, double standards being applied only to the Jewish state. Uh, but there are other reasons why this term occupation is uh, is so um, misplaced in this context. Um, and part of it uh, is that it relies on what Israel did in 1967 in terms of uh, applying a temporary framework to administer the West Bank, Judea and Samaria uh, in a period where it anticipated there would be a peace agreement with Jordan. Uh, and under the land for peace framework, Israel anticipated giving Jordan some of the West Bank in order that it would secure peace uh, with that kingdom. Um, in 1994, when that peace agreement finally came, Jordan didn't want anything to do with the West Bank. And so that temporary framework that Israel established has continued. Uh, but the framework of occupation in a legal sense only exists in international law, where an, a, an area, a part of land is occupied from another sovereign. And we don't have that here. Uh, on the contrary, we have what was in 1948 uh, Israeli sovereign territory. That doesn't mean, of course, that that prejudges what any political solution would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and more recently, in the context of the Oslo Accords, we have the establishment of areas A, B and C uh, in the West Bank. That was a legal arrangement, uh, an international agreement that Israel entered into, one that was I have to say, immediately broken when the Palestinian Authority launched uh, the Intifada, uh, one of the um, very, um, very bases of, of their entering into the peace accords uh, was the renunciation of terror. And that has unfortunately never happened. But while the, one of the reasons Oslo is particularly significant is that it creates the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian autonomy in Area A. And so even if this term occupation, misplaced as it is in a legal sense, is being advanced in a political sense alone, while well, it's also uh, deeply problematic and mistaken because the Palestinians have self-governance, not just in the West Bank, 
But also, of course, since 2005 in the Gaza Strip, and we have seen what they have done with 16 years of self-governance in creating a terror statelet in Gaza. Exactly. Uh, and the cons- exactly. <laughs> Natasha, time is, is becoming our enemy. So a couple of big questions, but I hope with Twitter-like or Telegram-like um, responses, if possible. It came Not up being in, on either, I shall do my best. <laughs> it came up in the Monk debate as well. Uh, legitimacy. The claim that Israel is an illegitimate state. I recall Douglas Murray responding and referring to countries like Pakistan. Uh, mm. Is Israel an illegitimate state? It has the same legitimacy as uh, any other as a starting point because Israel declared its independence in 1948. Uh, I don't see people questioning the legitimacy of uh, the United States. Uh, There was also a declaration of independence. Um, But there is also an argument that Israel's legitimacy is greater because of the historical uh, political context in which it declared its independence. That, of course, was in the context of the British mandate coming to an end. That mandate was designed to facilitate the self-determination of the Jews uh, in their historic uh, homeland. The principle of self-determination, which has significant importance now in international law, also lends itself strongly to the legitimacy uh, of uh, the State of Israel. But I would stress that I don't think we should be asking for any special treatment for Israel. We should simply be asking for an equal application of international law and international standards. And on that basis, Israel is uh, as legitimate uh, as any other state that established itself. Um, And many people, I think, convincingly argue uh, even more so. And even more so also because unlike countries like the United States or Pakistan, it also came out of a recommendation of a majority in the United Nations General Assembly following the recommendation of the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. So the layers of legitimacy are certainly deeper and thicker. Um, yes, you, you sp- I, I wouldn't necessarily rely on, on a recommendation that, uh, albeit was put forward, was then immediately rejected um, by many, including, of course, Israel's neighbors. By the other the side. United- Yes, but the United Nations can recommend all of the, all that it likes. Um, ultimately, these are you know political statements. Um, it really comes down to Israel establishing itself and and being able to do so in 1948 because of the many decades of backbreaking state building that the Jewish issue have engaged in. The state institutions were established long before. Uh, the state itself was declared and the declaration was possible and Israel uh, successfully defending itself in 1948 was possible because it is all it had already uh, built a, a state before the declaration. Uh, that is something, unfortunately, the Palestinian leadership uh, has never engaged in. Um, very unfortunate. We are down to our last seconds, but I need to ask you, there is an election coming in Britain um, very, very imminently. Uh, how will it affect the Jewish community? How will it affect the relationship with Israel? Uh, it is an unfortunate reality that many in the Jewish community in the UK are already leaving. Um, there is leaving, a, a, leaving the country. There, there is a, an unprecedented, so I am told, um, uh, rate uh, of Aliyah. Uh, there is real concern, certainly amongst uh, the Jewish community and discussion Friday night dinner tables. Um, We have perhaps good reason uh, to uh, have that concern on the basis of some of the rhetoric that has come out of the uh, opposition front bench, the shadow um, front bench. uh, Meaning meaning in American terms, the Labour Party. The Labour Party and uh, undoubtedly the next government um, of the United Kingdom. Our election is coming up on the 4th of July. Um, Our uh, foreign minister to be, David Lammy, has indicated that he would support um, arrest warrants against Israelis if they were issued by uh, the ICC. Uh, there has been a strong contention for a recognition of uh, a state of Palestine, um, and there has been a clear issue within these elections, um, this general election itself, Gaza and Israel has played out very strongly uh, 
amongst the the Labour politicians that are campaigning. Um, many of them have um, put this issue amongst their the very top. Uh, some even higher than the cost of living crisis and other issues, which uh, really ought to be at the forefront of the British electorate. Well. For, for many of them on the Labour benches, uh, Gaza takes priority and, and by extension, that is uh, essentially the, the continued war against Israel and the desire to annihilate the Jewish people. Uh, it's a very dismal note on which to end. Many of us have seen from afar the Saturday demonstrations in central London uh, and the way the police have soft peddled many of those demonstrations, including intimidating and threatening behavior against Jews. Natasha, uh, I don't know how to say thank you, not just for returning to the show, JBS viewers, as, as you wished and I wished, but for your continued stand on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people and what's right and what's true. If you haven't watched the Monk debate, please find it and watch it in its entirety. It'll give you confidence in the Jewish and pro-Israel future. Natasha Hausdorf, thank you. JBS viewers, this is David Harris. Thank you for joining us on Defending Israel.